Okay, hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Travis Broughton. Uh, I'm with Intel in the Open Source Technology Center. And uh, today I'll, I'm here with uh, Jamal and Melvin to talk about some work that PlumGrid did in the OpenStack Innovation Center. So how many of you are familiar with the uh, OpenStack Innovation Center? Quick show of hands, anyone? Okay, um, so for the, the rest of you, um, OSIC is a collaboration between Intel and Rackspace under Intel's Cloud for All initiative. And really our goal is to improve the scalability and ease of use, ease of uh, operations and deployment uh, at scale for uh, enterprise, class, uh, enterprise usages uh, within, within the OpenStack community. And we, we really kind of have a, a path that we follow in, in that pursuit. So you know, first we want to grow the number of OpenStack, uh, of con OpenStack contributors. So you know, more people contributing to OpenStack uh, will hopefully increase the number of contributions upstream. And then finally, you know, we want to do that to enable OpenStack innovation uh, at a larger uh, and increasing scale. So in, in the first uh, area, the growing the number of OpenStack contributors, uh, we, between Intel and Rackspace, we've had over uh, 200 individuals uh, come through and, and get trained. Uh, and, and that adds up to a lot of time spent uh, in, in growing the community and enabling people uh, to be onboarded to become uh, OpenStack uh, upstream contributors. Uh, Additionally, the direct contributions. So those people uh, are committing code, they're uh, contributing reviews, they're contributing uh, blueprints. And so we focus on six main areas, again, uh, geared towards enterprise usages and uh, scalability. So manageability, reliability and resilience, uh, scalability, high availability, security and compliance, and simplicity. Uh, and we've contributed to uh, over 25 uh, OpenStack projects, We've done uh, 115 blueprints and uh, over 40,000 code reviews and almost 30,000 patch sets. And that's in the uh, past year that the uh, OpenStack uh, Innovation Center has been in existence. We announced this uh, in Tokyo. Uh, we uh, gave an update in Austin and this continues the momentum that we've made. So the last piece is, you know, even though we've brought on board a number of contributors and we have people uh, working for both of our companies who are contributing upstream, uh, we know that there are a lot of folks out there who um, you know, may have, uh, who, who have great ideas, who are great developers, but maybe have a harder time uh, scrounging up testing capacity compared to a, a large scale hosting provider or somebody who manufactures uh, CPUs. So for that, we've launched uh, the OpenStack Cloud. So we've got a thousand nodes uh, in uh, Dallas that are managed by Rackspace, another uh, thousand nodes coming online uh, in California that uh, are available for the community for a number of different usages. And over the past year of the, the cluster's existence, uh, we've had over uh, 60 community projects come through. So people get a reservation for three weeks and they're able to use uh, between uh, uh, 50 and 200 nodes uh, carved up. They can, uh, as a bare metal reservation, they can stand up their own uh, stack. Uh, or we have a, uh, a cluster uh, that is running an OpenStack cloud that's available for uh, all sorts of user, uh, users to uh, access. You saw this morning in the keynote, uh, the uh, OpenStack hackathon in Guadalajara, uh, the, uh, the hackathon users use the OpenStack cluster uh, for their for the hackathon, you also saw the uh, infrastructure community. Uh, the infrastructure team is doing a number of integration tests uh, running in the OSIC cluster. And uh, today, I'm I'm happy to have one of these uh, 63 uh, cluster projects, one of these companies that has done upstream uh, use of the cluster uh, with PlumGrid. Uh, one of the requirements in uh, using the cluster is that you share your results with the community. Uh, and what better way to share uh, the results than uh, at the OpenStack Summit. All right, uh, thanks, Travis. So uh, today I'm gonna share uh, what was the test that uh, 
Plum Get did on the OSA cluster. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the infrastructure that we had, uh, what different versions of OpenStack did we install, uh, and then talk about some of the results uh, that we got. Uh, in the end, I'm going to share some of the challenges that we had during uh, during the overall uh, installation. What did we learn from uh, from the from the tests? Uh, so let's start with uh, so the first thing that I'm going to start with is the uh, overall infrastructure that we had. So we were provided uh, with a 131 physical node uh, infrastructure at uh, 06, one of the one of their uh, data centers. Uh, total time that we had the cluster with us was uh, close to three weeks. Uh, and the installation that we did, uh, so we started with, so it was back in April that we got the first uh, uh, first cluster with us, the first access. Uh, and the installation that we did was that we started with the OpenStack uh, Ansible uh, installation, the Liberty version. Uh, along with the Liberty version, we installed a PlumGrid Open Networking Suite, which is an SDN platform for OpenStack clouds. Uh, and I'm going to talk briefly on, on what it is, because I'm going to refer to it later in the talk as well. Uh, and uh, also PlumGrid Cloud Apex, which is our cloud visualization and monitoring tool. Uh, some of our high level results like, uh, so, so this was the first time that we got the cluster back in April. Uh, so more the overall results or overall testing that we performed from, uh, from a perspective was that uh, how the different components within OpenStack, like not just related to SDN, but generally what are the different components, how did they interact at such, uh, at, like at this scale? Uh, so what were the overall results that we get from that perspective? Uh, I'll, get, I'll also share some results at the end, uh, what were the different tests that we did and what were the results. But from um, uh, initially what our uh, main goal was to figure out uh, and test out it uh, at this number at this uh, scale number, what are the different components, how are the different components interacting with each other. Uh, and then uh, we again got the same um, 131 node physical cluster uh, in like October, last three weeks, in fact, just immediate last three weeks uh, before the summit. Uh, and in this, we had a different goal. So uh, we started with the, uh, on the installation side, we did Mitaka-based installation. So we uh, used the latest OpenStack in, uh, version. And again, uh, from the PlumGate's perspective, use the PlumGate Open Networking Suite version 6, which is our latest release, uh, along with the Cloud Apex uh, latest release as well. Uh, from, uh, from the result side, uh, since the last time we were uh, keeping the things in within certain limits and then just testing out, uh, uh, having a broad spectrum of tests, uh, in the latest testing that we did for th last three weeks, uh, we just uh, tried to max out on the, uh, on, uh, on, on the like, number of virtual machines and then test the, certain, uh, test, test the system on certain number. Uh, and I'll share uh, the test as well at the end. Uh, so moving forward, uh, just a quick uh, uh, overview of PlumGrid ONS. Uh, so PlumGrid actually provides an SDN-based uh, networking solution for your OpenStack and container clouds. Uh, our PlumGrid Open Networking Suite is uh, a suite which is uh, integrated with OpenStack. So we have a Neutron plugin. Uh, we, what we do is that we replace the OVS plugin uh, and then install the PlumGrid plugin, plugin uh, with it. So you use the same Neutron API layer, but the backend implementation uh, is done by PlumGrid ONS. Along with PlumGrid ONS is the Cloud Apex, which is our monitoring and operational tool, uh, which actually integrates with uh, PlumGrid ONS and gets all the information uh, by ONS. Uh, one of the key differentiators uh, is that we don't use OVS as our data plane component. We replace the OVS by the IOWiser component. Uh, IOWiser is an open source uh, Linux-based community project. Uh, and uh, what it does is that, I guess, from a very high-level perspective, quickly, it's, uh, it's an extendable data plane. It's a programmable data plane. And it allows us to uh, install uh, or, uh, like, install dynamic network functions uh, in, a, in a running system uh, in dynamic manner. So we can pretty much... Uh, by, by the use of IOWiser, we can uh, provide like functionalities around security, segmentation, policies, uh, all in a very distributed manner. So uh, it's a complete, so ONS is a complete software-only solution. Uh, it gets installed, the IOWiser component gets installed in your compute hypervisors. Uh, we use the VXLAN-based overlay mechanism 
and using the VXLAN based overlay mechanism, we expose the concept of virtual domains. Uh, I, in, in, even in the previous slide, you saw some comments around uh, tenants, and then I wrote in virtual domains besides that as well. Uh, so in a nutshell, what a virtual domain is, it's uh, from an OpenStack perspective, what we do is that we, uh, like a separate tenant in OpenStack is a separate virtual domain within Plum Grid. Uh, basically, it, uh, this, uh, by this, what we do is that the virtual domain becomes a virtual data center for each tenant. So within that particular virtual domain, you can have completely heterogeneous topologies, uh, create different kind of network functions, either those which are natively available within the platform or any third party functionalities, irrespective of what other, what other tenant is doing in its own virtual domain. So that isolation and segmentation becomes very key from, from that perspective. And again, it's fully distributed, so uh, those scale and flexibility, flexibility and all those things come with it. Uh, so very quickly again, um, since we're going to talk about the infrastructure, uh, how uh, Plumgate ONS uh, gets installed within the OpenStack infrastructure. So we have, uh, from an inf infrastructure, from a like overall overview point of view, we have three basic components. Uh, we have the control pane architecture, which is known as the Plumgate directors. So Plumgate Directors is the control pane architecture for us, which pretty much just manages the resources underneath. Uh, then the data plane component, like I talked before, IOWISER is our data plane component. So the IOWISER edge component gets installed inside the kernel of your compute hyper, uh, nodes. So there is no user space agent, anything like that. It's just a kernel module which actually gets installed inside the uh, kernel of your compute nodes and then provides all the networking and policies and all those kind of functionalities right there inside the kernel. Uh, and then since we learn in the overlay model, we have uh, a gateway with, which is basically the same IOWISER kernel module, just gets installed in any bare metal x86 gateway uh, servers. It's a, it's a transition from a VXLAN to a VLAN uh, uh, model. So since we run in an overlay, we have a gateway which just encapsulate and de-encapsulate the traffic for us. Uh, and the fourth one is the Cloud Apex. So uh, the Cloud Apex is a monitoring tool uh, what we have is that uh, since we all anyways are running inside the kernel from IOWISER, we have all that information uh, readily available to us. So based on that information, what we do that we uh, built up this cloud information, uh, the cloud visualization tool. Uh, this was the, uh, it, was a, it was a product that came out earlier this year. Now it's going through uh, a second phase of release. But we have seen a lot of attraction around with our current customer base and our prospects since uh, this, is sol this is solving a major uh, area for us. And even uh, in this cluster, you'll see a couple of pictures that I have, uh, a couple of images that I have uh, uh, here that actually show you how easy it becomes from an operational perspective to actually look around and, and get a feel of it. So moving on uh, from our test bed setup, we, like I talked before, we had 131 um, physical nodes, uh, and we, uh, we distributed in it in a, in a highly uh, available architecture. So we had three OpenStack controller nodes that were also hosting PlumGrid control plane LXCs, uh, LXCs uh, in those. And then we had, uh, in, there was an infra host which was basically just hosting a, a, a repository, a package repository for us, and since we are running, installing the OSAD Ansible, uh, there is a deploy node uh, that you need to set it up just to do the deployment. So that was basically our infra node. And from a compute nodes, we had 121 compute nodes. Uh, in the compute nodes, it's a Nova compute nodes along with PlumGit IOWISER edge component that gets installed inside the kernel of those uh, compute nodes. And you for uh, external like gateway uh, traffic, like from a traffic from within the cloud going outside in the legacy world on the, towards the internet, you have the gateway servers, the four uh, gateway servers. Again, uh, it's just bare metal x86 servers which are having an OS and getting installed with the PlumGate IOWISER gateway component inside the kernel. Basically just a transition from an overlay VXLAN uh, to a VLAN model. Uh, okay, so moving forward from there, uh, from an installation perspective, I've just kept some images. Uh, the overall, uh, just just a point over here, the overall uh, OSIC report, like uh, 
all the testing that we did, including the installation, what did we learn, all, everything is included in one of the reports that we have published. Uh, one report is already published from uh, the last testing that we did, and the second one that we just completed last few weeks ago. Uh, it's going to be published very soon as well. So all these installation uh, things and every, everything is going to be part of that. But I just kept like a couple of uh, images from, from that report. Uh, on the left-hand side is just an overview of the dashboard, OpenStack dashboard. On the right is the Plumgate console. Uh, Plumgate console is just a config uh, manager for us uh, from an SDN perspective, from a networking perspective. And right now what you see uh, in the image, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an external network topology. What, what we have is that uh, within Plumgate SDN, uh, the provider network is, uh, is a separate virtual domain for us, which we call a service virtual domain, which actually then uh, can be uh, shared across multiple tenants. Uh, it becomes a way where uh, we, we do it in a way where you can have an external network which is shared across multiple tenants and then you can apply some common policies ac across your tenants as well. Still in a distributed manner, there is no uh, specific, like there's no hairpin of traffic, it's still distributed inside the kernel. But from a security perspective, from a policies perspective, you have a global uh, presence where you can pr perform those policies. So this just depicts uh, uh, a bunch of different networks. You see like different networks connecting to the outside world. So this is the uh, image from uh, Cloud Apex. Cloud Apex is again our visualization tool. Uh, so right now what you see in the, in the picture is uh, a complete uh, overview of your infrastructure. Uh, I know, I'm not sure. I'm sure you cannot see or you cannot probably read at the top. So on the left side, on the, uh, like on the left hand side, the top colors that you see, the big block colors, these are the these are the tenants or virtual domains. So just like tenants from OpenStack perspective, and on the top you can see that the total number of tenants are 144. Uh, that's the tested. That's the number that they tested with, and then the total number of workloads that you have in your cloud. So the bigger boxes on the top show your tenants, and then the smaller, box, uh, smaller square boxes are your workloads. Those workloads can be your VMs, can be your containers, whichever you are deploying in your cloud. So right now, it's uh, showing like 4,000 uh, virtual machines, and the containers are zero since we, we didn't, uh, it's, this was just a, a virtual machine testing. Uh, on the bottom of this, uh, <clears throat> On the left-hand side on the bottom is the physical uh, uh, setup. So you have uh, all the physical servers set up in racks. Uh, this is, again, we, we run LLDP, so we know the exact rack combination as well. And on the right-hand side is the details panel. Uh, these fancy colors that you're seeing, this is just depicting. So uh, during our testing, our uh, engineers did some metric testing as well, like what was the current bandwidth or what was the different traffic analysis of each VM that is uh, in different tenants. So these red and yellow colors just show that uh, there are some VMs which are showing higher traffic, there are some which are less traffic. Uh, from an operational point of view, uh, this, this helps a lot from an operational point of view since from one interactive dashboard you can get to know all the details of your cluster. Uh, so a couple of more views of uh, Cloud Apex. Uh, on the left, top left is the security view. Again, since you have uh, different tenants from an admin prospect perspective, it gets really difficult to figure out if uh, even some if even there are some basic issues during te during your testing. It, it gets difficult to figure out what's uh, what can be the issue. What different layer you have like multiple different layers within your cloud. So if it's a physical problem, if it's a virtual problem, if it's a uh, security group problem, if it's uh, some logical constructs problem. So uh, this actually helps us to uh, get into details. This view is uh, our dynamic security view. So each tenant gets its own dynamic security view. And on the top left, you see a lot of red lines that is just showing uh, that each, that there are certain security groups within that tenant which have rejected flows. And the white and gray lines show that they are uh, accepted flows. Again, from a operational point of view, uh, this was tested in a sense that you can quickly figure out if there are some rejected flows and you need to change them or uh, and vice versa. Uh, so moving on on the testing part, uh, we what we did was that we uh, have uh, different we ran different test suite during the time that was allotted to us. 
one of the first tests that we ran was just to, uh, after the installation, just to do some uh, functional API validation testing. So we used the Tempest suit for running the uh, for API validation tests, and we did uh, a bunch of tests based on uh, uh, overall uh, different components of within OpenStack. Uh, again, um, I've kept an image over here of all the tests uh, that that we did, but it's uh, it's just an image from a report that we did. So all the details around exact testing, uh, what was the result, everything is completely documented inside the. Uh, inside the test report as well, inside the report that we has already published. Uh, from, uh, from a summary perspective, uh, we didn't find any deviation from uh, the usual behavior that OpenStack should do. So uh, from, from an installation perspective, it was a good thing that every component within installation was working fine. So uh, for scale purposes, we used heat templates. Uh, we created a template uh, for each tenant, like uh, and then the external network as well. So the template was having a bunch of different uh, net, like network function constructs for each particular tenant. Uh, we created a typical external network topology that can, consists of a couple of layer two constructs that we call the bridge, uh, then the layer three construct, the virtual router, the dynamic router, uh, and uh, then the NAT as well. Uh, all of these uh, functionalities are natively available part of the open networking suite and are again uh, completely uh, distributed, are being done by the IOWISER inside the kernel. So there is no uh, network node, no centralized node, or even uh, the control plane. Uh, we actually test some, uh, this, uh, test the same in the HA part of the next few tests as well. But from, um, from, a, from that perspective, it's completely, all these network functionalities are completely distributed. So we created uh, 140 tenants, uh, each sending having a particular topology, external network topology, and then 4,000 VMs uh, as part of the overall testing. Uh, one of the questions, again, uh, is important for us that we go through uh, even in our internal testing as well, uh, that there is one thing that you reach certain number, whichever is possible in the environment that is given to you, but at that number, are, uh, is, is, is it still highly available? Is it still uh, an HA architecture? So whatever tests that we perform, even internally within our own uh, testing with the Plumgate ONS and Cloud Apex, we did similar tests in the, uh, uh, in, at OSIC uh, cluster as well. Uh, so the, there are a little bit more detail uh, in the OSIC report, but I just kept a high level detail that uh, for the maximum uh, number of tenants and VMs that we had in, this, in our uh, data center at that time, we did uh, the single director failure test. Uh, what basically it is that we talked about that we have three control plane, uh, uh, you can say components, which are acting in active, 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 so they are highly available. And each of these control plane components has some processes uh, and they are all distributed among the three. So if we kill one of the director planes, it shouldn't affect the topology since it should be evenly distributed among the other two. So that's what we tested in the, as, a, as one of the tests where we just killed one of the director Alexis and all the processes which were running on that particular LXC get caught started in the other two. But from the data plane perspective, since we never touch, the traffic never goes through the control plane, it should never have any uh, problem on the data plane. So the data plane uh, was completely verified for all the VMs and there was no issue from that side. Uh, similar tests were again done from a full cluster failure. Like for some reason, if all your cluster that the, 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 you have three uh, control plane clusters, if all your cluster fails, what happens in that case? So we did a similar test where we killed all the three director Alexis. Since again, uh, the IOWISER is our forwarding plane, it's intelligent enough, all the data is already there from uh, the topology perspective that, that is currently deployed. So that uh, there shouldn't be any downtime even if you're uh, director cluster is down, which we call a headless mode. So uh, we tested the same over here. We killed all the three directors and uh, successfully then verified connectivity across all the VMs uh, that we had. 
And you, you'll get a bit more details around again from, uh, from the report that is published. Uh, but these are the results uh, that we have uh, from a high level. Uh, so uh, the last bit of testing that we did uh, was uh, the rally testing. So the rally testing basically tests uh, different, gets benchmarking numbers uh, at different scale uh, for different operations that you can do from an SDN perspective. Uh, some of the tests are written on the right hand side, like creating networks, creating routers and listing them, uh, creating security groups and listing them, uh, subnets and then creating VMs and listing them. So we did uh, like uh, the rally testing at three different uh, times. One was at without any load of the system, so there is no VMs, uh, nothing, and you just uh, create these uh, do, uh, do rally testing. And then the next was at a certain uh, uh, number of tenants and 160 VMs, and then the third was at 80 tenants and 1600 VMs. Uh, again, all uh, these, so we, we have a bunch of uh, graphs in there uh, where uh, you see a lot of details around uh, what are the numbers that we got, uh, and all these graphs are in detail explained inside the uh, OSIC report as well. Uh, from a high level, I'm just showing the graphs. Uh, I think um, uh, you would you would see a lot of different, uh, a lot more details in the OSIC report. But from a high level, what we saw was that uh, what was expected as well that as as the scale grew from no load to a certain number the overall API time was increasing, but there wasn't any alarm, alarming increase or any major red flags. It was a usual increase that we expected as well. All right, so uh, let's talk about some of the learnings that we had during the uh, course of uh, these three weeks testing. Uh, we, so from an installation perspective, uh, we didn't face any major issues. Uh, it took us like two days to actually do, do the complete one 30 node uh, installation. Uh, just, a ma just a minor tweak was that at certain times we figured that there, uh, during the OSAD installation, what happens is that the deploy node actually tries to uh, do SSH into each of the uh, uh, slave nodes, you can say, the, all the compute nodes, and then, and then uh, downloads a bunch of stuff and uh, things. So there were a couple of like SSH timeout errors. So the uh, idea was to actually uh, increase those uh, timeout uh, uh, tries and the timeout numbers within the playbooks, and then that just that just uh, does it for you. So other than that, uh, there weren't any major issues from an installation perspective that we faced. Uh, from uh, f from the testing phase. So um, there are some, uh, so from the testing phase, one of the major things that we faced in the start since we were using community playbooks for the OSAD uh, installation, uh, that at, at, at certain number of uh, scale, uh, we started seeing uh, the API calls or uh, the horizon dashboard being extremely slow. Uh, it would take time to actually just uh, like scroll in between the pages of Horizon or even a basic API call was taking some time. So we, uh, and we actually touched back with the community. We got a lot of help from our Rackspace team. Um, and then we tweaked some of those uh, things based on their recommendation. So one was this thing, uh, the usual suspect, which in this case is, is a RabbitMQ. So uh, around RabbitMQ, you, we tweaked some, one of the things was that we applied some optimization patches, which you need to apply at a certain uh, scale when you're running at a certain scale. Uh, and another was that uh, at production systems, you need to, uh, there are some tuning that you need to do within the, within the system limits and some kernel parameters. So we applied those tunings uh, along with uh, some uh, thread pool sizes for Nova and Neutron services. Um, there are some, uh, since we were running the OSAT playbooks, uh, the community playbooks, so there were some changes which you need to apply when you were actually looking at that particular scale. Uh, and that those were uh, with the recommendation of Rackspace team and that, uh, uh, that was uh, done after that. Uh, and when we made these changes, uh, the API, the, there was a marked difference from the API call response time and on the Horizon dashboard as well. So uh, definitely when we started uh, the testing in October phase, we applied them right from the start and didn't see them uh, again, uh, at least uh, uh, when we did the testing again this October. 
Uh, another common issue that you face from Horizon is that uh, at certain scale, the Horizon gets slow as well. Again, it's uh, something that we have seen um, uh, in the community as well. Uh, what we did at the end was that since we had limited time, we just changed the landing page from the initial page because in the initial page, it has to do a lot of different queries for a lot of data that it needs to show. So the easier way it is to just, when you log in, you just change the login page to projects or instances, something like that. So it doesn't actually uh, take a lot of time when you're actually logging in. Uh, yes, so though from, uh, from the challenges, these are some of the names. These are some of the uh, points, major points. Again, you'll see much more detailed uh, ideas in, in our report as well. Um, and yep, so that's about it. That's, and I think I'll hand over to Melvin. Yep. yep. All right, thanks. So, uh, Travis talked about essentially what OSIC is, uh, its mission and tenants, um, and how we're carrying out that mission and tenants right at a high level. Um, and that's in, you know, the, the contributors, you can see the numbers from the amount of uh, contributors, which uh, translate to contributions, which translates to, of course, uh, things getting fixed and OpenStack essentially, or potentially being adopted um, at, a, at a larger uh, clip. Um, Jamal, you know, uh, presented PlumGrid's successful use of OSIC, right? Um, 131 nodes, OpenStack Ansible Liberty, um, ONS v4, which is, I don't know if you guys paid attention to that, but they deployed ONS v4 and Cloud Apex v1 in April. And they took those lessons that were learned, right? And in October, they bumped up to uh, ONS v6 and then Cloud Apex v2. So, that speaks to basically the use, the usefulness of the cluster in terms of learning uh, some things in a um, staging environment to say uh, that you can push into production. Um, so operations essentially, as he was saying, is, was, was charged with ensuring uh, the cluster is available, uh, stays available. Uh, so one might argue, right, the logical step uh, next, or the question that comes to mind is how do I, how do I get access to uh, OSIC. So don't really uh, gloss over from all of this, but, and I'm not going to try to explain all of it, but essentially you go to OSIC.org and you submit a request there and there's this great process that happens <laughs> and uh, you get your request approved, you get your nodes. Basically what we do in operations amongst other things is we make sure that those nodes um, work. Make sure there's no issues with the hard drives, make sure the NIC cards are working perfectly fine um, so that when you get them, they're ready to go out the box per se. Um, and then again, after you're, so once you're done using them, essentially we have a uh, cleanup process. We have a provisioning and a cleanup process that we try to reduce the amount of time from uh, all this stuff that happens here <laughs> to you getting the nodes and actually using them. So requesting resources, you can go to osic.org slash clusters. Um, you can learn more about the cluster itself at that bit.ly link, um, or bit.ly, however you want to say it. Uh, and essentially, that link will tell you what's available. It will tell you more details about those, uh, that flow chart that I provided. Uh, it will tell you uh, specifications for the nodes as well, right? And one thing that we're looking at doing is moving from potentially um, having to go to the website to something that, because right now you have to like do emailing and so forth and so on with filling out a form. So we came up with possibly using GitHub, still in the works, but it's actually is gonna be pretty good for us because, and for you as well, because you can see what folks have requested. Um, you'll get a chance to see how that process happens so you can skip some of the delay Right in terms of you requesting pro, uh, requesting resources and getting those resources, um, and that's pretty much it. So I'll pass it back over to Jamal for questions. Yep. So if you have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to. Yep. Okay. So uh, one question. Yep. Uh, did you check uh, data path on all those de deployment that you did? Uh, data path meaning any performance or? Yeah, if uh, your VMs, you, you've, you've instantiated about 4,000 VMs, what for? Um, I mean, you didn't really need to 
create VMs unless they were doing something. Otherwise, just ports would be enough, right? We would actually, so uh, by increasing the load on the, like, so when you actually create the VMs, like 4,000 VMs, you are really uh, creating the load on your uh, end components within the open stack, right? Uh, and we did see, we did learn from a fact that even after certain number of, uh, uh, like, scale around the VMs, if you're hitting 2,500, 3,000, what are the different things that you learn from if you're just doing even NOVA list, how much time it take just, just to do the NOVA list part as well. So there were like other op goals from that perspective. Uh, specifically on the performance number, we didn't do any performance testing between uh, like between the data path, between data path. For that, you don't need even 2,000, 4,000 VMs, you can do it as, as less. But we didn't do any performance tests for this now. Oh, sorry, so uh, maybe I misunderstood. So I thought that your uh, product is in networking. Yeah. But you something like you check the, um, the so uh, it's Nova. Maybe. Yeah, it's it's more on uh, the, the the overall goal was to actually check from a scale perspective that what are the different components and how they work at this uh, at certain particular number. Uh, we didn't do specific uh, tests on scale, but what we actually did were different, like around creating multiple different. Uh, network components uh, at this scale, what are the different uh, things that you see when you are actually creating, uh, like when you are actually creating different components doing rally tests at this scale. Uh, the performance tests and all the other base testing that we do during uh, internally when we are testing our releases out, we do some performance tests during that, those. I would be happy to share those numbers with you uh, on offline, but uh, right now in this cluster we actually didn't uh, touch any performance numbers. Okay, so um, first question is actually, I think, to you. If, yeah. um, if someone wants to start testing on OSIC, then what's the pipeline like there? You mean in terms of uh, cycle time from yeah. request to yes. actually getting capacity? I think we're, you know. It varies, it right? Var That's yeah. why I said, like, you, you fill out all this stuff, yeah. but you may miss something. So the hope is we're moving it to GitHub we get out of the delay sometimes that emails cause. Yeah. So like you make a request and the governance board, there's a board that decides who gets what, right? The governance comes back and says, hey, we need this information. Well, it's not maybe lost in a bunch of emails, it's on GitHub and comments and an issue that you submit. And then we're waiting on you to reply back. So I, we use tags to show um, where those, the status of those requests Right, but assuming uh, yeah, I, I, I think from approval yeah. to starting testing, I think from the approval gate, we're running about six to eight weeks out. There, there's a bit of a queue and everyone gets a three week. So all of the clusters are basically always consumed. Uh, and so we're, we're generally accepting requests for the next next, okay. right? Uh, um, and then, but we do have the, uh, the OpenStack project where we have a developer cloud and the, the cycle time to get into that is much slower. Um, no, so if you're I, looking for VMs, no, no, if you're I, looking I for bare metal, you have probably for six bare weeks. bare metal and, and actually at much larger scale than this, would that be possible? Uh, like a thousand nodes? Not a thousand nodes, no. no. We, we've got it carved up. I think 200 is the largest pool, single pool that we can allocate right now. It's 240, Thank you. Two, 242. 242, yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, in my case, um, it's, uh, I didn't know about this IO visor, found mm -hmm. it very interesting. Uh, right. I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about, um, um, for example, um, is it easier to troubleshoot than um, OBS? For example, you just, just regular TCP dump and the data in the disaster recovery scenario that you proposed, that, that you tested, sorry, uh, I wonder if once the control plane is all down, I reckon that because the control plane is down, it cannot react to topology changes, for example, right? That is another assumption I have. And um, um, yes, I wonder if you could comment a little bit more about this, this, um, this layer two, layer three uh, component. Uh, so uh, one of the question is that what is IOWiser? So IOWiser is, uh, is an open source Linux based uh, community project. It's basically uh, uh, where we, it's based on the EPPF technology. It runs on the EPPF technology and it's from a high level perspective, it's a programmable 
it's an eBPF technology. Uh, yeah, so it's based on the eBPF technology, and it's basically an extendable data plane for you. Uh, we actually uh, don't use OVS since we use IOWISER, so we actually replace the OVS plugin within the OpenStack uh, installations and use uh, the IOWISER data plane component for us. Uh, and the second question you asked was around, uh, and, and I, otherwise it is no doubt a much broader concept, so we can always touch offline as well. Yes. I think it's already time as well. But uh, the second was around the HA part. So uh, what uh, happens around the HA is that once you uh, bring out the control pin down, since the control pin is down, you, you're not able to change anything, and that uh, that is uh, that is how it works. But So the physical, if, if the physical link goes down, uh, the, the, all the VMs on that particular host would obviously go down as well. But uh, from a control pin architecture, since the control pin is down, you cannot make changes in the data plane and uh, once the control pin is down. But whatever is there right now, like whatever all the data communication that is happening, that is uh, continues to happen because the, uh, all the data, all the forwarding tables and all the information is already there in the data plane. Yeah, so DBDK is uh, basically it bypasses the kernel. So uh, for performance, we don't use DBDK. We use the XDB for IOWISER. And we can touch offline. It's a, it's a quite, quite clever, uh, wide uh, topic for it. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, all right. Thanks, guys, for showing up. Uh, and I think that's about it.